During Epiphany, we've been talking about discernment. Different practices have been explained, including Ignatian spiritual practices, and last week, the daily examine. One of the through lines of these sermons has been that discernment is a way of seeking God in our lives, recognizing God's movement and responding. Today, I'll talk about seeking God through pursuing justice. In Isaiah 58, the Israelites have recently returned back to the Promised Land following their exile in Babylon. They have been fasting in the fifth and seventh months of the year, commemorating the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And yet, despite their fasting, they say they have not heard a response from God. We're going to walk through the passage, so you're welcome to pull up Isaiah 58 to follow along. In the first two verses, God describes both the rebellion of the house of Jacob and yet how simultaneously they seek me and delight to know my ways. They delight to draw near to God. The people of Israel want to draw near to God, and they've been fasting and practicing religious observances, but they're not successful in doing so. They're in rebellion. Why is this? In verse 3, the people of Israel ask the, that question to God. Why do we fast, but you don't see? Why do we humble ourselves, but you don't notice? We could just as easily say, why do I come to church if you don't pay attention to me? Why should I pray, God, if you don't answer me? I wonder if you have ever felt like the people of Israel, desiring to grow closer to God and feeling like God does not even notice. And then God responds, Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all of your workers. You serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. There are a few things that are interesting to me about God's response. The first is that God does respond. The people of Israel were saying that they felt like God didn't even notice them. God didn't see them. But God's response makes it clear that God does hear and see and notice, even if God was not responding in the way that they were requesting. Maybe they hadn't heard God's response up until that point because it wasn't what they had wanted or expected to hear. Second, the problem that God identifies is not with how they fast from a ritual perspective. God doesn't say, for instance, that they were fasting on the wrong days or that they hadn't appropriately cleansed themselves prior to fasting. God didn't say that they were praying the wrong prayers or that they weren't spiritual enough. God said that they were oppressing their workers and serving their own interests. God's concern is that they were seeking God without practicing justice. God is telling them and telling us that those things are at odds with one another. If you are perpetuating injustice, it doesn't matter if you're fasting or praying. It doesn't matter that you go to church. Your voice will not be heard on high. Practicing justice is not optional to the Christian life. It is integral. Third, God specifically points out areas of injustice that are within the immediate control of the people that he's speaking to. God didn't say something general about injustice. God names a specific instance. You're oppressing your workers. You're profiting off their toil. This is something that presumably the listener can do something about. You can raise their wages by reducing your own profit. You can provide them better benefits. You can improve their working conditions. God tells them the steps that are needed to be close to him in verses 6 to 7. Practice justice towards others. God gives a whole list of ways to do this. To loose the bonds of injustice. To undo the thongs of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free. To break every yoke. 
to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your houses. When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. When I read this list, I feel convicted. I know that I can do more. I feel particularly compelled by the example of sharing bread with the hungry. This is not something that I practice in my everyday life, and yet I know that there are people who are hungry all over the city, maybe even in our church. According to Feeding America, 1.5 million New Yorkers are struggling to feed themselves and their families. This includes one in four children in New York City who are experiencing food insecurity. One in four in our city, right here, where we can do something about it. And we have a way to meet some of those needs right here at St. Peter's by volunteering at or donating to our food pantry every Saturday, which serves thousands of people a year. I could also carry extra food in my bag to give it to those who ask for it on the subway or the street, something that I've thought about but haven't been practicing, even though we have more than enough food at home. I wonder what actions from the list call out to you. Perhaps it's to loose the bonds of injustice through advocacy, attending a rally at City Hall calling for the mayor to close down Rikers Island, writing to your elected officials about ending solitary confinement, or donating to organizations like the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund that fight every day against racism and injustice. Or perhaps not oppressing your workers calls out to you. The passage from Isaiah comes from a time when the wealthy elite preyed upon the poor through terrible wages, exacerbating the gaps between the wealthy and the poor. In other words, a time very much like today. I understand that you may identify with the one who is preyed upon rather than the wealthy elite. But if you are a supervisor to anyone, what can you do to improve wages or offer better health care coverage, even at a cost to the bottom line? Is everyone paid fairly, regardless of race or gender or disability? Does everyone have the same rates of promotions and raises? Or perhaps clothing the naked calls out to you. Do you have clothes in good condition that you're not wearing that could be given to a clothing closet? Or when you're buying a new coat for yourself, could you buy a second for someone in need? Sometimes I can feel overwhelmed by the enormity of injustice in our society. There are so many things that are not right. Ways that our society places burden upon burden on the poor and the marginalized. And it can make me feel paralyzed. So overwhelmed by the problems that I don't know what I could possibly do about it. But God is calling each of us just to take that next step. What is within your immediate control? Start there. Do justice there. And then take that next step and the next. With each step, God says that your light shall break forth and healing shall spring up, making way for that next step and the one after. Big problems are not tackled overnight or alone, but in community and with Christ, we can take those next steps. We can make change. And what does God say will happen if we practice justice? Starting in verse 8, the prophet says, Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and will satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt 
You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. What a promise. You shall call and the Lord will answer. The Lord will guide you continually. We will find God if we are pursuing justice. God's desire for justice is ultimately rooted in God's love for us. God's love for you. God will not stand for us to be held by the bonds of injustice. So God will not tolerate us oppressing others. 1 John 4.20 puts it succinctly. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have not whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. God loves us and calls us to follow him in loving others. Let us together be a church where we take steps every day to better love our neighbors. Let us join with Christ to be in our neighborhood and in our city the repairers of the breach and the restorers of the streets. Let us remind each other that practicing justice is integral to the spiritual life and not peripheral. Let each of us take the next step towards justice. Amen.